when, when you can hear me. Well, 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 Christmas week, the Federal Communications Commission moved forward with the first ever regulation of the Internet. Nobody seems to be pleased with those regulations, and I imagine that you all are like a lot of others that I talk to. They don't think they're going to be around for too terribly long. And I think it is fair to say that congressional Republicans and Democrats are a little bit to blame for this. Too few members have engaged seriously on the topic of net neutrality. And other than a handful of members at the Energy and Commerce Committee, neither caucus has laid out a national vision for technology policy. When Congress fails to move forward on an issue, bureaucracies step in. Both Republicans and Democrats active on the tech policy issue have really hyper-focused on technology, the delivery systems as the be-all and end-all of tech policy without giving sufficient thought to what is driving that technology and what is responsible for its development. We alternately cast that regulatory gaze or either try to aggressively defend from regulation every new application, every new device, every new protocol that is coming forward, and we don't stop and look at the interconnected whole and articulate our approaches and how we would use our core values. What I hear from many of you is that you see Republican and Democrat approaches to technology policy as being stylized. You feel like Republicans defend big corporate interests. You feel like Democrats are trying to smother every forward-moving technology with reams of regulation. For conservatives, the challenge, for conservatives, the challenge to this is going to be to look beyond the platforms and the technology and to seek out how we put our conservative business principles to work in this arena. We must see the latest regulatory impulse of the FCC as the wake-up call that it is. We must seriously apply our philosophy of government to the new economy that will drive American life and culture in this century. The degree to which the economy is kept free, the degree to which property rights are protected, the degree to which free speech is assured, many of those are going to be decided by how we debate tech policy and these are our core conservative values. So it is imperative that we move forward and that we defend them in the tech policy debate in the next decade and also in this coming Congress. They can best be applied through three propositions that I want to talk with you about today. First, what I choose to call the creative economy is the emerging driver of the American economy, and it should be the focus of technology policy. Second, intellectual property is the primary commodity of this new technology and the economy. For our prosperity to endure, intellectual property rights are going to have to be reinforced. And finally, the internet is the primary marketplace for the creative economy. It must be kept free, it must be kept predictable, and it must be kept accessible. Proposition number one, the ascendant sector, the ascendant economic sector in this nation is the creative economy. We can all agree that labor costs, a cocktail of corporate taxes, increased and overbearing regulation, those have caused America's industrial sector to be unable to be the economic engine that it was in generations past. 
Clearly, our ascendant strength and prosperity will come from the new sector, which is our creative economy. The creative economy comprises all that stuff that you consume online every single day and the way you perform your ordinary daily task. I want to see a show of hands. If we're to label laptops, iPhones, iPads, MP3 players, netbooks, Blackberries, as consumption devices, how many of you can honestly say that you have only one consumption device on your person today? Just a show of hands, and I think it proves my point. That's what I thought. The proliferation of these consumption devices is a product of and a testament to the strength of our creative economy, which is producing ever more stuff that you're going to consume. In the past, while these devices have become the focus of tech policy, they are actually incidental to the greater underlying economy. That should be the focus of where we direct our congressional efforts. Conservatives must not let big government, regulation, and taxation limit the long-term potential of the creative economy. That's what we've seen happen with the industrial economy. Let's learn from those mistakes. As the creative economy produces, it employs. It employs individuals in jobs that are not under scrutiny by OSHA or the EPA and are as frequently headquartered in someone's garage or kitchen or a coffee shop as they are in the Silicon Valley. I was struck by a column that Thomas Friedman recently wrote. It was after he had returned from a trip to India. Without ever naming it, he was stunned by the pace the innovation and entrepreneurship was taking hold by India's tech architecture and their booming creative economy. He profiled two brothers in Delhi. They ran a cell phone based money transfer system for low income Indians. The headquarters for this mini bank was their garage. Let me ask you a question. What kind of bureaucratic alphabet soup would someone in the U.S. face if they wanted to start the same business? Where would they begin? Would it be the FTC, the FCC, the SEC? You know the answers. The bureaucracy hampers that kind of innovation and the entrepreneur moves away. The conservative mission is to leave behind an obsession with devices and focus on the overall environment and overall health of the creative economy. To ensure America's future prosperity, conservatives must vigor vigorously apply the principles of small government. We must resist the urge to permit industrial age bureaucracy to assert redundant jurisdiction over entrepreneurs. We must defend against Washington's instinct to hyper-regulate all that is new and imperfectly understood. Proposition number two, the primary commodity of the creative economy is intellectual property. Culturally, we all differentiate between intellectual and material property rights. For the creative economy to thrive, we need to dissolve that barrier and ensure that intellectual property rights are as strictly enforced as material property rights. Our founders in Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8, established an intellectual property right to be treated with the same reverence as material property protected by the Fifth Amendment. Conservatives have always been champions of private property and the rule of law. It's a natural pillar of our perspective, so we must protect intellectual property at home while abroad we are beginning to move and protect that resource as the vital natural resource that it is. The entrepreneurs who create these new consumables that you all have have to be assured that those hours of toiling 
and developing a concept into a product and then seeking to monetize that concept in the global marketplace is going to lead to their rewards. Just as we defend forward in the war on terror, it is going to be an imperative that we defend intellectual property rights beyond our shores. Here's an example. Our president has set as a national goal making America the leader in green energy technologies. Now, he has wide bipartisan support on that goal. My own home state of Tennessee has produced more green patents than just about any other state. And I want to see those green patents become green factories, green products, and green jobs. To achieve it, though, the administration and Congress must protect our domestic <laughs> innovators who, through the creative economy, are turning those ideas into energy industry and jobs. That means we have to be active domestically and globally. To that end, we must, prior we must prioritize the removal of barriers to protecting IP, patents, and copyright, and providing certainty to the innovative community. Renewed defense of intellectual property will be as much a cultural challenge as it is a legislative one. Still, there are some items that this Congress should move forward and take action on. These include a patent reform bill that will have strict deterrence for infringements. Compromise on orphan works legislation. Passage of rogue website legislation, allowing law enforcement to go after organized online criminals who steal from American creators and rights holders. Your privacy is also your property. You own the virtual you. Every day, more of your activities can be tracked. They often result in lower prices, and better products, more opportunities, and improved efficiencies, but not always. And government's role here is not to determine what a information is or is not or should or should not be private. That is a standard that Washington should not apply to the individual. Rather, government should simply assure that the individuals know what activities are followed and easily allow you to protect those activities that you decide are nobody else's business. While we protect intellectual property, the chief commodity that drives the creative economy, we must also work to expand the reach of that economy. We can achieve more by simply providing predictability. Proposition number three. The creative economy thrives online in what is a unique, prosperous, and until recently, free marketplace. The fact that the space whose products are created and consumed is virtual in many ways is really quite incidental. The diversity of online consumption is extraordinary and it's going to be vital to our future prosperity. The FCC thought that they were pushing into a regulatory vacuum last month when they unveiled their net neutrality rules. I think that what they may have met with is a congressional hurricane. No one, Republican or Democrat, congressman or commissioner, believes that these new regulations are the final word. They are the first draft of many regulations to come. And as the rules are revised, revised, and revised, they create instability, unpredictability, and that is the greatest deterrent of all to investment. Let's not pretend that they were put in place to correct some market failure or to address a widespread, even existent consumer disadvantage. The FCC's action to this hypothetical problem is also narrow-minded. Reinterpreting online commerce 
as online communication in order to assert jurisdiction. Think about it. They want to regulate what is the least important part of commerce, which is the means of transition. If individuals are not able to create without fear of government intervention, regulation, or increased tax burden, if they are hampered in their ability to monetize their innovations, a fear that the FCC has really made quite real, investment will slow dramatically, stifling the potential of innovators. So here's the opportunity for conservatives to make a stand. The free marketplace is the cornerstone of our philosophy of government. Does the internet deserve special regulation simply because it conducts commerce in a new way? I say no. Should the internet be regulated in extraordinary ways in a manner we have not applied to other markets? Should we accept any regulation beyond the traditional protections of private property, enforcement of law, and protection of speech? Conservatives should not. It is incumbent now for us to immediately reverse the decision and better define the FCC's jurisdiction. In my view, that jurisdiction does not extend to online commerce in any way, nor to the platforms where that commerce takes place. And here are the next steps. The Energy and Commerce Committee will move ahead shortly on our resolution of disapproval under the Congressional Review Act. I expect the resolution to pass the House, and given the dissatisfaction on both sides of the aisle, the Senate is going to pass it as well. On the first day of this new Congress, I filed H.R. 96, my bill to reassert congressional jurisdiction over the Internet, removing the FCC's unilateral authority in the area. We have gathered over 60 co-sponsors so far, and I have every reason to anticipate that the legislation will pass shortly after our resolution of disapproval. Beginning with the coming repeal of the FCC overreach, conservatives who should apply our philosophy to the broader arena of tech policy, we must do so in the spirit of classic defense of free markets and property rights while guarding against needless regulation and federal intervention. For the like-minded in this audience, I urge you to be vigorous in the debates to come. Ever more dazzling and wonderful devices must not distract us from the creative economy and what underpins it. We have to make certain that we insert our perspective knowing that to allow needless government expansion into the creative economy, to neglect the urgent defense of intellectual property, or to hobble the virtual marketplace is to concede far more than just a techie debate over incidental issues. Conservatives' failure to be aggressive on this front will do more than concede the debate before we have reached the podium. It would stifle America's potential as the creative leader in the creative economy for the 21st century. I urge you to stand with me, to be active in the debate. Of course, you can always get me on Facebook, Twitter, blackburn.house.gov. We look forward to hearing from you, you weighing in, and making certain that we keep America's creative economy and virtual marketplace free. Thank you. Has time for a question or two, for if, as long as her voice lasts. So, if there's a as question, as long as the voice lasts. I believe I heard you say that uh, we have a, a property interest in our privacy, and uh, normally property rights are good against both private citizens and against the government. And so, I'm wondering if. Uh, government intrusions on privacy are uh, functionally a violation of a, a property interest in, in your view. 
I think that as we move forward with Energy and Commerce and Judiciary Committee, you're going to see a discussion about the virtual you and who owns your information that is on, on the internet. Uh, making certain that, as I said in my remarks, that you retain your ownership and that you retain the ownership of the information that is there and on the internet. We want to make certain that you, on your virtual you. Hi, uh, James O'Brien with the Online Trust Alliance. And I, I was just interested, the uh, Department of Commerce just mentioned, you know, $10 trillion in global transactions, which usually would get the attention of, of Congress. So why do you think, a basic question, there's so little leadership on technology policy in, in the U.S. House and, and Senate for that matter? And I think that that's a fair question. Uh, in the coming Congress, this Congress, you're going to see um, a much more active approach to virtual marketplaces, to the creative economy, and to protecting that intellectual property because so much of our economy is now centered in the work that is taking place in the creative community. Think about, uh, let me use my district in Tennessee as an example. We have a very robust creative community there. It's filled with songwriters, TV producers. Uh, you have many that have worked in digital music delivery and digital content delivery. And you could almost call the creative economy the content economy also. And they've worked in this for many years. They've developed some fantastic platforms and delivery systems that are all attached to the internet because of this. You now see our area of the country as a leader in health informatics and health IT. You are also seeing, as I mentioned in my remarks, many of these platforms and some of the practices that come from the being used in green technology, much of this has come out of the auto industry that is headquartered in our area with Nissan North America, with GM doing the Ecotech engine in our district. So uh, there's kind of a shared um, expertise and a synergy that begins to develop. Now, one of the things we have learned, <coughs> pardon me, one of the things that we have learned from this is that um, as you see these platforms develop, then people share those ideas. The next great uh, item comes along and someone says, well, this industrial sector or this manufacturing sector can benefit from this information. Uh, maybe a platform that was originally developed in the, the music industry is used for health IT, or maybe it is used for uh, security of buildings. You see them used in different applications and those innovators are coming to us and saying we are strengthening the existing economy and we also are growing a new economy that is built, the chief commodity being that intellectual property. I think that's why you see the numbers from commerce being as high as they are because of the infiltration and the reach of these new innovations into strengthening what we already have, as well as creating something whole and something new. Thank you so much, Congresswoman. I really appreciate that. It sounds like your voice is good.